Good evening, everyone, and the joy and the peace of the Lord be with you all. Welcome along to this year's Good Friday uh, devotion, a short act of Christian devotion in this time that we share together. Uh, the service is in three uh, linking parts. We move through the Passion from the Trial to the Cross to the Tomb, and each unit has the same component parts. We'll read the Scripture. I'll then, after the gospel acclamation, give a short, uh, prompted homiletic thought to hopefully leave a silence for a, a guided meditation. And then there'll be this piece of music played from the Reflection Hymn. You can keep turning back, looking at the words which are articulating what we're trying to think and say. And then we close the service uh, when Wendy offers the praise, were you there when they crucified my Lord? O Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall show forth your praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. O great and glorious King in heaven, we praise you. We praise you in our hearts, and though these vocal cords have been stripped from song, our hearts have not been stripped from praise. Bless us with a filling of your Holy Spirit, that our minds and our hearts and our souls would converge inside our very being this night, and that the worship we offer you would indeed bring you glory and praise and bring us blessing as we consider the great passion and work of our Saviour Jesus, who on this very day hung upon that cross at Calvary and bled and died so that we might breathe and live, not just now in a life through common grace, but one touched by saving grace, so that when this life would end, a life in glory would begin. We confess our many sins through ill words, thoughts, and deeds, and through the death of Christ, have mercy upon us. Hear us now as we unite this prayer in the words the Saviour taught us to offer you. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The first text that we turn to is Mark 14, and it's the trial of the Saviour. I will read the first verse, and as many as are able, if you read the next verse. So you'll be on the even verses, and I'll be on the odd verses. And that way, as God's gathered people, we will have, with these vocal cords, spoken his word in our presence. They took Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests, the elders, and the teachers of the law came together. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so they could put him to death, but they did not find any. Then some stood up and gave this false testimony against him. Yet even then, their testimony did not agree. But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Again the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? Then 
The high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses? He asked. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. For the first meditation, what I want you to think about is this. There can be the exact same question offered in two very different ways. During a trial or an interrogation of any sort, questions are asked. What might you say about the nature of the questions and the interrogation of the Saviour inside the Sanhedrin? It was Mickey Mouse, false. False accusations, not honest questions. Notice the difference there. There can be an honest question. And they had an opportunity to ask the Son of God who was going to die for sin an honest question. Ah, but instead they raged with a collection of false accusations. There's many things we could say about the trial of the Savior, but this night we just stop with that. And so in the silence that follows, ask yourself, how often do you ask an honest question and how often do you falsely accuse? Let me show you how it works in my life. Something might happen, yeah? Here's an honest question. Why did that happen? Here's the same with a false accusation. Why did that happen? Here's an honest question you might ask when the Lord deals you a providence. Open hands. Who are you, Lord? Watch the same question with a closed fist. Who are you? So in the silence, meditate on the trial. Think over this week. Think over this year. What's happened to your life, your family, your kirk, your fellowship? When were the hands open with an honest question? And when was it a closed fist with a false accusation? We move to the second scripture for this evening, the cross, Mark 15, I'm on the odd and yourself on the even verses. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. When some of those standing near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, Surely this man was the Son of God. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there 
This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. For the second meditation, let's think about suffering. Because in some sense, all of us have suffered in the last 12 months. And I want you to meditate before God with this one question in your mind. Have I got my suffering in perspective, Lord? Or have I made a critical error in my walk with you? Have I allowed myself to get my suffering out of perspective? What a dangerous road that might be if you would walk it. Here is how many bad clergy help people with their suffering. They usually love the sound of their own voice. And you say to them, well, I'm done. I'm done in. Oh, they say, I remember when this happened to me. And then that happened. And then this happened. And then, oh, it just brings back when that happened to me. And you see what they attempt to do with the sufferer. They say to the sufferer, here is your suffering, sufferer. And I want to care for you, and I don't want your suffering to break you. So I'll tell you all about mine. My suffering's bigger than yours, you see. Now, straighten yourself up. I've helped you. When I leave you now, you'll be able to say, oh, well, the minister helped me there. He showed me what was what. I ought to just get myself sorted out. I ought to be mortified about the things I complain about in light of his suffering. In light of his. The problem with all of us and all our hearts is it's all subjective. Some of you might love your cat or dog more than I love some of my family. That could well be true. How can you measure my amount of love and loss? And how can I measure it against yours? You're one subjective object in a world of subjective objects. How can you measure it? And you could never do it. And so never be tempted to. Never be tempted to seek peace and consolation by measuring your pain against the pain of the other who's next to you. No. You measure it next to him who's on the cross. Never was there suffering like thine, says the hymn. Because it's true, he who knew no sin became sin for you and me. He who dwelt in a place we call eternity crushed himself into time. He who lived in this thing of boundless space entered this thing called material with atoms. And he who was unlimited in love walked in flesh and bone and interacted with human beings like you and me. And he hung and died that a debt would be paid, that sin would be forgiven, that eternity's door would be thrown open, the temple curtain being ripped in two. Is the clue there? The second he died... That curtain is ripped, which was a physical partition to show Israel there is a heaven and there is an earth. There is a nearer presence of God and there is a far presence, alienation, estrangement from God. It's torn open. You will find the greatest peace in the greatest pain, not when you meditate upon the pain of the families whose notices are in the window of the flower center. But when you meditate upon the Savior who hung on the cross. So over the next minute or two, ponder, O Lord, where have I been measuring myself next to all the deaths in the parish? Where have I been measuring the next bad diagnosis, some major surgery, some huge financial loss or ruin, and been using that to try to hold myself together? 
And when have you been able to say, when I'm down, I look up to the cross? Because when you're on your knees, there's only one way you can look, isn't there? And that's up. Is your suffering in perspective? The third and final scripture for this evening is the tomb. It was preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath, so as evening approached. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. So Joseph bought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen, and placed it in a tomb cut out of rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Confidence to go to the grave, third meditation. He knew that's where he was going. He tells them three times, I'll be handed over to sinful men and they will crucify me. Is that how he always ended it? Why did he go to the cross? Because he loved the Father and the Holy Spirit? Of course he did. Because they loved him, the Godhead loving the Godhead? Yes, yes, of course. It wasn't because he loved us and he thought, you know, these creatures are made fantastically in our image. They're worth, they're worth redeeming. Yes, his love for the Father, his love for you and me and our crummy lives sometimes. That's why he would go to the cross. But surely one other reason why he would go to the cross is this, because it never ended there. When he spoke about it, he said, I'll be crucified, but in three days I will rise again. A conviction of the resurrection is how the Savior went to the cross. Your life got problems. I'll let you in on something I hope's not a secret for you. You don't have a problem that a resurrection won't fix. It's as simple as that. Is me going about my business in an unvaccinated manner a problem? Very well could be, I suppose. Children in and out of school, me in and out of the crematoriums, seeing people here at the kirk. I don't go in and out of houses. But I move about a fair bit. Do you think over the last 12 months I was praying that I would get vaccinated? No. I was praying he would come back for the resurrection. The vaccine only fixes one problem that leads to death. But we know the resurrection fixes the problem of death. And that's the difference, isn't it? That's the difference. Any vaccine, any treatment, what does it do? It fixes a problem that leads to death. But our Lord's resurrection fixes the problem of death. So, no, I'm not boasting about a vaccine. I'm glad it's there. I'll boast about Christ. And come Easter Sunday on my Facebook, it will be Jesus Christ has risen. You live in light of the resurrection far more than the light of the vaccine. It delays something, the vaccine. The resurrection fixes it. So, in light of that, what should our prayers be for the next 12 months? 
oh Lord, more vaccine? Another vaccine for another virus, another wave? Or, oh Lord Jesus, come back. Because friends, when he does, we will have some life worth living. What are you praying for in light of the tomb? Now after the silence here, uh, Wendy will close by singing Were You There When They Crucified My Lord? And I hope now we recognize Oh boy, we were there. <laughs> we're always there. Before we hear the peace, let's pray. Father, we are not worthy of the least of your mercy. And yet on Good Friday, we see we get the best of it. Help us live in light of people who have received the best. Let's not celebrate the crumbs of earth when we've been given the banquet of heaven. Bless us this night with the peace that passes all earthly understanding. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank mm-hmm. you.